In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Jesus. Come. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Well, the gospel that um, the gospel that we've heard today should be pretty obvious to all. It's very clear. The only reason why uh, you have a guest preacher is that uh, your preacher, your priest, your pastor is um, serving in a different capacity, and um, I'm his friend, uh, so I was able to fill in for him. I teach at St. Vladimir Seminary, and on this joyous occasion, I announce to you that uh, the Assembly of Bishops has decided that whenever a faculty member from one of the seminaries travels to a parish like me today here, um, he must enlist at least three potential candidates for um, seminary. So for the rest of the liturgy, consider a man, a woman, younger, older, married, or single, whom I can take back with me to St. Vlad's Seminary. <laughs> Seriously, it'd be very nice. So the Gospel today speaks about a man who was very miserable. For 38 years, he has been waiting on the margin of this pool of water to be healed. And at first, you will be you will have compassion and say, well, the poor man, 38 years, can you imagine that? How is it that he's not healed if in that pool the water is said to have been moved, agitated by an angel and made and given the power of healing and people get healed there? Why is this man not healed in 38 years? He says, I have nobody to put me in the water. I am paralyzed. And he can't get himself in the water. He would need a friend. But he doesn't have a friend, apparently. And that's when you start to wonder, what kind of a person is it that in 38 years has managed to alienate everybody so thoroughly that nobody puts him in the water? And he won't forgive it either. He keeps mentioning it to whoever happens to be there. So now Jesus is there and he tells him, these people are horrible. There isn't one of them to have mercy on me and put me in the water. And so wonder with me what kind of person this was. I don't think it was the greatest human being, really. Think about yourselves. <clears throat> Maybe you have a favorite enemy. Somebody you really, really love to hate. The person that you go to confession about and you say, I can't get over this encounter. I really can't stand this man. Would you have, in 38 years, found it in your heart to move him into the water to get him healed? I want to believe that the answer is yes. But it didn't happen to this man. So for 30 years, 38 years, he's been paralyzed and he says, I do not have a man to throw me in the water. It's a terrible, terrible affliction. On the one hand, he's embittered, and we don't know exactly why people avoid him or why people don't want to help him. But we have to give them the benefit of being honest. Probably this man was somebody who we would say, he deserves what he got. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it's a terrible affliction for 38 years to be so alone. He's terribly by himself. And when he says, I do not have a man, in Greek there the word is anthropos, which means not a male, but a human being, anyone. In one of our hymns, this gospel, in one of our hymns that we sing, that is in church on the feast of this, uh, on the feast where we hear this gospel, we say that this is very meaningful. You know that in the Gospel of John, he never uses, the, the evangelist never uses words just randomly. Do you know what Pilate said when they brought out Jesus all blooded after they had scourged him and beaten him and presents him to the crowd? What does he say? He says, behold, the man, either, look, the anthropos, the human being. So our hymns take that 
from the Gospel of John and combine it with this reading today and imagine a dialogue, a more extensive dialogue between this man and Jesus. He says, I have no man to throw me in the water and to heal me. And the Lord answers, it was for you that I became man, that I became a human being, Anthropos. And because of you, I was clothed with flesh. And yet you say, I have no man. And the point is, we do have a man. And this is not about some person 2,000 and some years ago. And it's not about some place far, far away. This is about all of us. Do we have a man to heal us or do we not? When you go to confession, I hope you take advantage of this. We haven't been talking much about confession since, since before Pascha because it's not the time now, it's a time of joy. But in principle, since I'm here only now, I hope you take advantage of the opportunity that is given to us in confession. When you come paralyzed with your fears, with your guilt, with things you have done and things you ought to have done and didn't, and you come so paralyzed and sometimes also embarrassed. And I assure you, it's the same with us. I also, I hate confession. So whenever I have to go to confession, I feel burdened and paralyzed myself. But we receive the same assurance. It is for me, it is for you, it is for all of us that God himself became that man that takes us and throws us into the pool where we are healed. And when we depart, we depart indeed different. We depart alive to God. So the hymn says, this Sunday is not about then, but about now. Not about that person alone, but about us. And we know this is so because <clears throat> it, is, it ends well with this man. When we meet him again in the gospel today, it says Jesus found him again. <coughs> Where? Did you pay attention? Where did we find him again? In the temple. In the temple. This is precisely the place where we come and we give thanks. We recognize that we are made actually, we are wired in such a way that we act as priests. When we are <coughs> baptized, all of us who are baptized, whether you are baptized or chrismated, however you enter the church, as a baby, as an adult, doesn't matter. But you are clothed with the garment of Adam's priesthood. It is not this priesthood which administers the sacraments for our communities today. It is a larger and deeper priesthood. The priesthood in which Adam is called first to return the entire creation to God, to return it as an offering to God, so that God may bless through Adam the entire universe, the entire world, and to extend through Adam paradise gradually into the entire world. So all of us, we all have this calling and we exercise it when we bring our offering as we wake up and we drag ourselves into church and we bring ourselves here and you may wonder what offering do I have to bring? Well, all of us have already been bringing our offerings. It is the offering of our very own selves. If you came here, then you brought yourself here. You are the offering that you brought to God so that God may bless it. And you entrust it to God and we say this in liturgy. We entrust, we commit ourselves and our whole life and each other to Christ our God. And some of you bake that bread or bring the wine, which is the sign, the symbol of this entire community. You bring it and you entrust it to the priest and the priest takes it and brings it and entrust it to the work of God. And when time comes, he says, send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts here present and transform it, this bread into the body of your Christ and this wine into the blood of your Christ so that we receive it back. But we receive it back as something much higher and much greater. And the same applies not only to the bread, you've heard the Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread. It applies also to the offering of ourselves and our whole life. 
We entrust it to God and we receive it back transformed, transfigured, healed. So we are this man and we have been brought here. We do have a man, we do have the Anthropos who for us has come so that we can indeed be healed. And what else is there to remember? Where is this taking place? Sometimes, especially in the Gospel of John, names have great significance. This takes place in Bethesda. Not Maryland, of course, uh, but it's good that driving here you can be remember, reminded of Bethesda. Bethesda is an important name. In Hebrew, as in Arabic too. Bet, bet, bait, however you pronounce it. But Beit is house, like Beit Lechem. Here, Beit is the first part, and Chesed in Hebrew or Hasdo in Aramaic and Syriac means mercy. So, Beit Chesed, house of mercy. Now, this does not take place in Bethesda, Maryland, but it really doesn't take place only in Bethesda of old, in the Holy Land. It takes place in your church as well. Because if you look around, maybe you'll get the point. This is the house of mercy. This is the place where you come because it is the house of mercy. And there is no other reason why one should come. Of course you come because you have friends, because you love the choir, because you like the iconography, because you like Father Luke, or you like Deacon Christian, or maybe you do it because your parents drag you here. All kinds of reasons, they're all true. But the main reason, and the one that will get you again and again and again here, is because you know that here is the house of mercy. And God is the one who is the fount of mercy, who receives all in mercy. And mercy, says Saint Isaac the Syrian, a great, a great saint of the church whom everybody loves. There is no Christian, <coughs> no theologian, no bishop, whether in the Orthodox Church or in the Syriac Orthodox Church or in the Assyrian Church, the so-called Nestorians, or in the Latin Church, or in the South, in Ethiopia, or in the very North. Everybody <coughs> loves Saint Isaac. And he speaks about mercy a lot and says, mercy is the opposite of justice. Stop saying that God is just. What? Yes, that's what St. Isaac says. He says, God is not just. Has God ever been just to you? Has he not been merciful? And what exactly are we asking in church? Do we say, Lord, be righteous to me, be just to me, give me what I deserve, please. Or do we say, Lord, have mercy. And how many times do we say, Lord, have mercy in the liturgy? Maybe if you're daydreaming at times, you can start counting how many times we say, Lord, have mercy. It's a technique my grandmother taught me. Well, many times. This is what we're looking for. And St. Isaac says it's not justice, because justice has to do with the even scale. Remember the goddess Justitia of the Romans with the even scale and blindfolded, so she does not look at the person, irrespective of the person. She will dispense what is just according to the principle of justice. But mercy, St. Isaac says, has nothing to do with that. God does not judge according to some higher principle of justice. God judges according to his heart. And God is like a merciful mother, like a merciful father. Remember the father who receives the prodigal son and doesn't say, ah, welcome back. I have tallied up here the exact amount of money you owe me. Let's be just. No, he's merciful. He receives him back, no questions asked. And this is what drives the older brother mad. So St. Isaac says, God is not just, he's merciful. His justice is his mercy. His mercy is his justice. And never say that God is just because God in his mercy created the world. In his mercy will he transform the world 
according to the pattern that we see in the risen Christ, so that our very bodies, as they are, sometimes sick, sometimes broken, always mortal, will be transformed and made by God's mercy, immortal, capable of partnership with God forever, re-encountering those loved ones from which we have been parted through, through death. All of this shall be undone by God's mercy. And he, adds, he also says there is nothing in God's dealings with us which is not a matter of mercy, even though we feel that it's different sometimes. Sometimes we wonder, where is God's mercy when, when I suffer? Like this man that we hear about today. Even when we suffer, God's mercy is in, that, in the midst of that suffering. And I know it's easy for me to say it here and now. I'm not quite young, but still fairly young. Um, and I'm, not, I'm healthy or fairly healthy. And I live in a fairly stable environment. Bombs are not falling on me and I'm not being hunted. And I don't really suffer the way people suffer. So it's easy for me to say it. But I trust that St. Isaac knows what he says. He wasn't living in our kind of world. And he said, even when we perceive God's presence to be distant or to be uncomfortable, God knows what he's doing and trust he does it out of mercy. It is the best way to cleanse us and to transport us in the palm of his hand towards what he has in store for us. So we paralyzed like this man in the pool of Bethesda, like this man in the house of mercy. Trust that God, a merciful God, works with us and works in us. <clears throat> and we see that this is in the Acts of the Apostles today, how it happens that Christians become or are called to be merciful like their merciful Lord. Jesus heals the man, Peter heals today. And this is how the church functions. If we come to the house of mercy, we are to be transformed and to be made Christ-like. And if Christ is merciful, then guess how we ought to act when we move out, when we go out. Let us depart in peace. Let us move forth out of liturgy into the liturgy after liturgy, to our families, to our co-workers, to the world that functions according to different rules and the rules of the church, we are called to remember that we have received mercy and we should extend mercy. Nothing else, even if it is difficult to run things, but it is the only criterion by which we will be judged. The Lord himself says, be merciful as your Father in heaven also is merciful. He sends the Son over the sinful and over the righteous. So how much more we who are also sinful and unrighteous, how much more are we called to practice mercy, the hardest thing of all? And the only chance we have is to imitate our Lord, to imitate Him in humility. When a priest gives a blessing, <clears throat> he doesn't give his blessing, right? When Peter today heals, he doesn't say, in my name, be well. He always refers to the Christ whom he serves. So also anything that happens in church, you receive whatever you receive, sometimes from the hand of the priest through a blessing. It is not the priest. It is not the bishop. It is not the metropolitan, some patriarch. It is simply the Lord. The church does not have anything in itself. And so, we have to be on guard. Anytime we think we have something, that we have power, that we have authority, every time we become comfortable, we have money, we have stability, we have power, all these things are kids' games. And it should not get to our heads so quickly. Because the church is nothing except as, or in reference to Christ. And the judgment is also very serious. We must be merciful like Christ is merciful, first by tasting mercy, so we know how it tastes like. So we come here in the house of mercy to taste mercy, 
So that once we know the taste, we know how it is to be forgiven, we know how it is to not be judged, but to be empowered, to be healed, to return from this house of mercy like the woman found in adultery. She had committed adultery. And the Lord says, I do not condemn you. Go away, but sin no more. So he doesn't say, all right, continue. It's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. Everything we bring, all our baggage is a big deal. It is always the greatest sin. My sin is the greatest sin. Whoever you are, your sin, my sin is always the greatest sin. But it is also the sin that is forgiven. Once we know how it tastes like, we are told, and back to the gospel, the Lord tells this man, <clears throat> see that you do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse befalls you. So we know he was not okay, this man, but he became okay. And so are we. We're no better because we're orthodox. Someone said it very well, you know, on Holy Facebook, uh, one of those little memes, the church is made up of beggars. We're all beggars. But maybe we know where the bread is to be found. So we tell the other beggars, hey, I know where this bread is to be found. I know where the house of mercy is. And that's basically our role. So in short, so that Father Luke won't say I've preached too long, but it's too late anyway. Come and enter the house of mercy and meet the Lord of whom we say his mercy endures forever. Second, get sober and sin no more. And thirdly, go forth in peace, as we say, to practice mercy in the name of the Lord. Amen.